Hi everyone, we last left uh, Mole hidden in the wild wood with all those whistles and strange faces and strange noises and patters. So what will have befallen him? Let's find out. Meantime Rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses slipped from his knee. His head fell back, his mouth opened and he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped, the fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame and he woke with a start. Remembering what he'd been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his verses, poured over them for a minute, then looked round for Mole to ask him if he knew a good rhyme for something or other. But Mole was not there. He listened for a time, the house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find mole's tracks. There they were, sure enough. The galoshes were new, just bought for winter, and the pimples on their soles were fresh and sharp. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt around his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in the corner of the hall and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at the sight of this valorous animal, his pistols and the great ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling and pattering which he'd heard quite plainly on first entry died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge, then forsaking all paths he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground, and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's old Rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more, when at last to his joy he heard the little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it, and from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found Mole, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried, I've been so frightened, you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it. Mole, I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. If we have to come, we come in couples, at least. Then we're generally all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know, which we understand all about, and you don't, as yet. I mean, passwords and signs and sayings which have power and effect, and plans you carry in your pocket, and verses you repeat, and dodges and tricks you practice, all simple enough when you know them. But you've got to be known if you're small, or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you were bad your otter, it would be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Old Toad, said Rat, laughing heartily. He wouldn't show his face here alone, for not for a whole hat full of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of Rat's careless laughter, as well by the sight of his stick and his gleaming pistols, as he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Now then, said the Rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you understand. Too cold for one thing. Dear Ratty, said the poor Mole, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm sim simply dead beat, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a little longer while I get my strength back, if I'm to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured Rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now, anyhow, and there ought to be a bit of moon later. So the Mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out, and presently dropped off into sleep though of a broken and troubled sort, while the rat covered himself up too as best he might, for warmth and lay patiently with a pistol in his paw. When at last Mole woke up, much refreshed and in his usual spirits, the rat said, Now then, 
I must take a look outside and see if everything's quiet, and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a, a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied Rat briefly. Or rather down, it's snowing hard. The mole came and crouched beside him, looking out, and saw the wood had been so dread that had been so dreadful in quite a changed aspect. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. A fine powder filled the air and caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch, and the black boles of the trees showed up in the light that seemed to come from below. "'Well, well, it can't be helped,' said the rat, after pondering. "'We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. "'The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are, "'and now this snow makes everything look so different.' "'It did indeed. "'The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. "'However, they set out bravely and took a line that seemed to be most promising, "'holding on to each other and pretending with invincible cheerness "'that they recognised an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them. Or saw openings, gaps, or paths with familiar turn in them in the monotony of white space and black tree trunks that refused to vary. <clears throat> After an hour or so, they lost all count of time. They pulled up, dispirited, weary, and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep they could hardly drag their little legs through it, and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. "'We can't sit here very long,' said the rat. "'We shall have to make another push for it and do something or other. The cold is just too awful for anything, and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through.' He peered about him and considered. "'Look here,' he went on. "'This is what occurs to me.' There's a sort of dell down here in front of us, where the ground seems to be all hilly and humpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down there, try and find some sort of shelter, a cave or a hole with a dry floor to it, out of the snow and wind, and there we'll have a good rest before we try again, for we're both of us pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off or something may turn up. So, once more they got to their feet and struggled down into the dell where they were all hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits when rat, which the rat had spoken of when suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both front paws. Poor old mole, said rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at the leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get my handkerchief. I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a, a hidden branch or stump, said the mole miserably. Oh my, oh my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks as though it was made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Funny. He pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what's done it, said Mole, forgetting his grammar and his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy, busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily, while the, mat, while the Mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Oh, come on, Rat! Suddenly Rat cried, hooray, and then hooray, 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 and fell to executing a feeble jig in the snow. Oh, what have you found, Ratty? asked the Mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see, said the delighted Rat as he jigged on. The Mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good luck. Good luck. And we'll leave it there. And we'll find out what he's found next time. See you soon for chapter three, part three. Keep safe, keep happy and keep reading. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.